you for joining us for Church at Home. We want to encourage you not just to watch church today, but to have church. We believe that you can have church wherever you are. Rock Creek parents, we also want to help keep your kids engaged in their relationship with God and experience the same dynamic teaching that they would get at church every weekend. Be sure to check out those free resources at rockcreek.online slash kids at home. Although we may not be in the same physical location, it's important for us to stay spiritually connected as a community. To stay up to date on all things Rock Creek, follow us on social media or visit us online at rockcreek.online. Finally, we want to encourage you to continue to give generously. When you give today, you're not giving to Rock Creek, you're giving through Rock Creek. Your giving furthers our mission to help people know God, find freedom and discover purpose and make a difference. Now, let's dive into this week's service. Hey, Rock Creek Church, welcome again to another weekend, and we're so glad you joined us from wherever you're watching from, YouTube, Facebook, our website. Make sure you look for the link wherever you're watching from. If you haven't downloaded our app, you can also do that and take notes right inside of there. You can sign up for groups. You can give online. Made it super easy for you, uh, no matter where you are today. I'm excited because we're kicking off a brand new teaching series called Making Lemonade, as you can see behind me. And... Uh, I always like to give the premise behind our creative names for our teaching series at Rock Creek. And one of the things um, I love, trusty lemonade, what I love to drink during summertime, it's officially summer uh, in uh, Washington State. Uh, I don't know where you are watching from, but in Washington State, it's been pretty warm in the 80s. And so I love drinking lemonade. And uh, the thing about lemonade is it's, it's only lemonade once you make it into lemonade. If you just were to cut this lemon open and Go ahead and take a bite. It's actually sour. Um, uh, we used to torture our kids when they were younger. Go, hey, try this. Try this orange. And they would, mean parents, I know. And they would take a lemonade. They'd have a sour patch face. And, and so I thought to myself, what does the church need uh, to hear about? What questions are you asking that I could help answer from the Bible? And I think something I've heard repeated over the last six months even, uh, specifically, is how do we overcome tough moments in life? How do we overcome adversity? And so the whole teaching series for the next five weeks, okay, as we kind of dive into the middle of summer, is this thought. How do we take the sour things of life and make them sweet? How do we take the tough spots, the rough patches, and make them smooth? And so I'm gonna teach you how to take lemons, and make them into lemonade. And I hope this will help you, and I think this first uh, teaching today kind of sets the foundation for where we're gonna go uh, across over the next four to five weeks together. And so today's talk is entitled Productive Peace. Productive Peace. And so I'm gonna help you take the sour things of your life and make them sweet, and I'm gonna help you discover that actually there's a better way to live with peace that will help you become productive. And so here's our theme scripture out of Romans chapter 8. It says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I uh, see around here at Rock Creek, we believe everyone has a purpose. And until you discover that purpose, uh, life will just be okay. But once you get to it, once you discover it, life becomes really fun. You could say it this way. You take the sour things of life and you make them sweet. Because together as a church, we're going to make some lemonade regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're experiencing. But it all starts with this belief that I have a purpose. And then it goes on to here, wherever... God finds me, he can take the sour things and make them sweet. He can take the tough spots and turn them for our good. Here's what I've discovered in my own life. Not everything in my life is good, but the scriptures declare to us that God takes all of the stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uses it, he turns it, he transforms it, he shifts it for our good. And so even the painful stuff, even the difficult circumstances, even the moments we wish we would not have to go through, the scriptures declare to you and to me that he'll turn them for our good. He'll give us a, a position of peace so that we can actually be productive, so that we can be effective, that we can actually accomplish his purpose for our life. 
It's not in your notes today, but I thought I would make a reference, and you should write it down if you're taking notes. If you're not, you should. Mark chapter four. There's this amazing story about Jesus in the boat with the disciples. They've just done some amazing ministry, and Jesus was like, you know what? I need a break. Let's get in the boat, because a few of his disciples were fishermen. Let's get in the boat, go to the other side, so I can just have a moment to myself. Well, Jesus was tired after doing some ministry, so he fell asleep in the boat. The disciples started freaking out because there was this massive storm. And so they're losing them, their minds. They're, they don't know what to do. And of course, Jesus is peacefully sleeping. And so they, they go to find Jesus. He's asleep. They wake him up and say, hey, don't you care about us? And so Jesus says these words, peace be still. Now, in the narrative of scripture, it records that Jesus called the winds and the storm to be at peace. But I'd like to think that he was making a point to the disciples. Because it's one thing to have the natural surroundings be at peace, it's another thing for Jesus to speak peace to the inner you, right? To the inner myself, like to the inside, to what's happening on the inside, peace be still. Peace be still in your emotions, peace be still in just life. And so there's a natural peace where he speaks to the storm and says, peace be still. But then there's a supernatural element of the kind of peace that makes you productive, the kind of peace that helps you accomplish God's purpose for your life. And this is what I want for you, that you would take the sour things of life and make them into lemonade, the sweet part of the lemon. That you would allow God's grace to grip your life in such a way that you can experience not just natural peace, because it's one thing to have the situation that's difficult resolve. It's another thing to have peace in the midst of the difficult situation that hasn't yet resolved. And I think that kind of peace, uh, you can't put a price on. The kind of peace that you can have going through a difficult situation and still be at peace, uh, the world cannot give you that. And so here's a few thoughts I have, or actually let me give you a working, what I call a biblical definition of peace. It's not in your notes, but let me read it to you. A biblical definition, a working, that means it's, it's transforming, it's moving, it's flexible, okay, here it is. The actual state of wholeness or being made complete, okay, which includes prosperity and tranquility. And I put in parentheses in my notes, ongoing tranquility. And so it's not just your circumstance will resolve that was difficult, or the relational strain was restored, or your kids who are being crazy are not as crazy. It's actually a state of you as a person, the whole you, inside and outside, being at peace, being complete, uh, having a state of prosperity. And that's just not money, that means your life is prospering. Your spiritual life is prospering. And then there would be tranquility. And not just a one-time moment, but ongoing tranquility. It would be like you were at a spa forever. Like this kind of peace, you can't get from the world. So here's what I've discovered in my own life of what has robbed me of peace, and I think it'll help you. Here's the first one, worry. (laughs) Worry will rob you of your peace. The disciples were in the boat, there was the storm, and they were freaking out because they thought they were gonna die, and they were worried about it. Worry will rob you of your peace, not just one day a week, but all seven days. I think this next one that I've experienced is fear. Fear will rob you of your peace. Fear of the unknown, fear of the what ifs. Come on, who hasn't had a case of the what ifs? What if this happens? That's fear talk, not faith talk. And fear will rob the peace out of your life and get you to a place where you actually don't have lemonade, you just have the sour part. And number three, I think shame. Shame is a big one. And I've said this story before, but I've heard parents out in public literally say the word shame on you. And I think culture tries to put a lot of shame on people. I think when it comes to like this whole cancel culture thing, which we don't talk a lot about, but that whole premise behind that is shame, putting shame on people. And you know what the great thing about being a Christian is? Jesus came to break the shame off of you, to take the shame off of you. Listen, baby, there's no place in culture other than Jesus and Christianity that wants to take the shame off of you. Oftentimes, culture wants to put the shame on you, and it's actually a really bad motivator and will rob you of your peace. 
Regret is the next one. Regret will rob you of your peace. As you stay up late thinking, I wish I would have not done that. I wish I would have said this. I, I wish I wouldn't have made that mistake in this relationship. I wish I would have done differently with my kids and regret. I wish I could go back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Well, you can't. But if you live in the land of regret, you'll have no peace. And I think the last one that really bothers probably all of us is busyness. Just being busy. Being busy with no time in your schedule, no margin to just be with God. Busyness will rob you of your peace. And what's funny about busyness is that it's this weird cycle. We don't have peace, so we stay busy. And in staying busy, we still get actually worse. Because we don't wanna be still, because if we were still, we'd have to deal with what's really going on, and so we stay busy, which continues to rob us of our peace. And so I want to lay the foundation today that if you've experienced worry, fear, shame, regret, busyness, and you feel like life has been missing something, and it could just be peace, there is a hope for you today in the person of Jesus who can pull you out of that existence and turn the sour things of your life into the sweet things of life. Who can take your lemons, whether you uh, bottom yourself or life threw them at you, and turn them into lemonade. And so I think if you were to boil down the subject of peace, this idea of actual wholeness, of completeness, of prosperity and tranquility that's ongoing, I think there are three uh, types of peace uh, and you need all of them. Okay, three, three areas of peace in a person's life, and you need all of them. Okay, hear my words, you need all of them. And the first one is this, peace with God. Okay, this is the foundation. If we're gonna be productive in peace, you need peace with God. That's the foundation in which we launch from. If you don't have peace with God, you can't get to the other places of peace. Romans 5.1 says it this way, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace. Remember, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, tranquility that's ongoing. You have this kind of peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. See, so sin separated humanity from God. Jesus came and he bridged the gap so that we could have relationship with God like it was intended to. And because of the bridging of that gap, because of Jesus, we have peace. Peace with God because of Jesus. And so as you try to figure out how to take the lemons of life and turn them into lemonade. This is the foundational peace that you need. The first one, peace with God. Number two, you need peace with others. Peace with other people is essential for you to be productive in life. Ephesians 4, 3 says it this way, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace to be whole, to be complete, to have prosperity and tranquility that's ongoing for your soul. It's interesting, as you find peace for the inner you, often it affects the outer you. I've seen this play out even in my own dynamic of our family, of our church, that when I have peace, I'm actually more effective. When I have peace, I'm a better husband. When I have peace, I'm a better pastor. When I have peace, I'm a better friend. When I have peace, I'm a better person. When I have peace, I make a bigger impact for the kingdom of God with the purpose of God working in my life. But when there's no peace, I become less than God's best. I'm not as patient, I'm not as kind, I'm not as loving, I'm actually less effective when it comes to the purpose of God being worked out in my life. And so you gotta have peace with God, peace with others. Make every effort to pursue this kind of peace with other people. And the only way you can have peace with other people is through the power of the Holy Spirit, literally putting you together. It's not in your notes, but the Bible says God's blessing is on those things 
that are unified. And so when you discover the peace with God, you can now have that peace with other people because of the Holy Spirit at work in your life and through your life. The third area of peace is that you need peace with yourself. Peace with, with yourself. I know it seems like, wow, that's pretty simple, but the reality is most of us, if we were really honest, who are Christians, we're like, we get the whole peace with God thing. And I know I'm supposed to have peace with other people, and I try my best, but you know, people are people. But then we get to this last one, it's like, peace with ourselves? No, we are actually the most critical, we're the most harsh, we're the most unforgiving with ourselves. Yet in reality, when you can settle your past, come on, by finding peace through the person of Jesus, there are no limits for what God can do in you and through you. John 16, says this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace, notice this, in me. See, you can't have peace outside of Christ. It's temporary, it's a band-aid, it's a momentary high, but it will not last you for the longevity of your life. Only peace in me, that's in Jesus, actually transcends your circumstances, actually goes above the storms of life. So when Jesus told those disciples, peace be still to the storm, I actually think he wanted to say and look back and go, and peace inside of you, peace in me. Here on earth, you're gonna have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, here it is, because I have overcome the world. Peace with ourselves. So that even as we go through difficult times, even as the world throws the lemons at us, we can have peace. We can make some really good, tasty lemonade. Peace with God, peace with others, and peace with ourselves. The three areas of peace that I want for you, that God wants for you. He doesn't want you to let worry, fear, shame, guilt, regret rob you of peace, but it starts with God, and after you get the peace with God, it works to others, and after you get to the others, it works inside of you. And so I think I would be a bad pastor, a a bad communicator, if I didn't tell you how to get this kind of peace. And not only get it, but keep it. See, it's one thing to have a moment in a church service like we're experiencing now where you're like, oh my gosh, I do not have peace with God. I've never said yes to following Jesus. I have never gotten there yet, or I don't have peace with other people. Man, I have some relationship strains, and I've realized now that it's because I haven't been making any lemonade. I've just been allowing the lemons to sit and rot and fester versus turning them into something or allowing God to turn them into something. Or maybe you have a past and you haven't settled it that you allow the past hurts and pains and yesteryears of life to continue to direct the current present state of your life. So wherever you're at, I want you to get peace and I want you to keep peace. I want you to go through the storms of life and although God may tell them to be still, he may not, but you can have the stillness on the inside and make it through whatever you face because of the peace of God. And so here's the Here's the first step in getting it and keeping it. Number one, you have to say yes to following Jesus. You have to say yes. You have to make a commitment to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That means he's Lord of all, not just the Sundays, not just your group time, but every day, every minute, every hour, every second of your life, he is Lord of all. He gets the final say. He gets to be the captain of your ship. He gets to direct your thinking, your actions, your behavior, your relationships. He is in charge. Isaiah 26, three says it this way, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You wanna get peace and keep it? Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Let Jesus be the focal point and first priority in your life. I was recently talking with my kids. I have three young kids, a five, six, and eight year old, and we were talking about important people in our life, and as we were leaving the restaurant, and 
we were talking about important people and my son made a comment about, Dad, who's most important? And I said, Jesus. And he goes, what? Not mom? I said, nope. Goes like this, Jesus, mom, you guys, my three kids, everybody else. And his little eight-year-old mind was being blown because he's like, I thought it would be mom. And then my wife looks at him and says, that's exactly the way it's supposed to be. If dad loves Jesus first, he'll love me the best, and then he'll love you next. Because in reality, Jesus is the starting point. We must say yes to following him, putting our trust in him, putting our thoughts on him, and letting him be in charge. You wanna have peace, and you wanna keep it number two? You gotta keep your relationships right and your account short. Let me explain it. Gotta keep your relationships with people right. And keep those accounts of all the things they've done wrong really short. We keep it that way in our family and we always say, hey, keep it short accounts, keep short accounts, keep short accounts. And that simply means this, that we're not gonna hold what you've done wrong or the mark you've missed or the imperfections that you've, uh, we've experienced through your life and we're not gonna hold you to it for the rest of your life. There's nothing worse, and maybe you've experienced this, than having a fight with a significant other where they go, you know, I remember three years ago you had this, 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 and this, and two years, like, if you, if you haven't had that fight, you haven't uh, uh, been in a real relationship. At some point, someone, because we're human, is gonna hold something you've done a long time ago against you. And thank God, he didn't do that to us. That when Jesus came and bridged the gap between humanity and God, it was a once and for all, and so when you put your trust in him like we talked about, you actually are forgiven. The shame is taken off, and you are in right standing with God, which means he doesn't keep an account of all of your sin and shortcomings and imperfections. And so if we're gonna have peace with God and peace with others, you gotta keep your relationships right, which means you have to intentionally, when relationships throw lemons at you and you're ducking for it, you start grabbing them and you make some lemonade. James 3.18 says it this way, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace. And here's what will happen. You'll reap a harvest of righteousness. Are you a peacemaker today? Are you a lemonade maker? Or do you just like starting little, little battles, little wars everywhere you go in your relationships? I've done both. And can I tell you, it's better to live in peace because you actually are more effective, not only here and now, but for the kingdom of God. Romans 12, 18 says it this way, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Wait, wait, with everyone? Yeah, in the original language, that word everyone means everyone. I know what you're thinking. So I'm supposed to just roll over, Pastor Brian, is that what you're saying? I'm just supposed to let people, you know, keep throwing lemons at me and Keep trying to catch them all, make lemon. No, no, like listen, you don't have to be a doormat. But as a follower of Christ, my intention, my propensity, the thing that moves me toward making peace is that God has made peace with me through Jesus. And so my desire as a follower of Jesus, who's put my trust and faith in Jesus, is to try to live in peace and take the sour things of life and let the Spirit of God make them sweet. Colossians 3.15 says it this way, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. It's your calling. Part of your purpose as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, is to live in peace in peace. Peace with God, peace with others, peace with ourselves. See, if we let worry, fear, regret, shame rob us of our peace, we're missing out on our calling. We're falling short of God's best for us. And for some of you watching today, it's been a while since you've experienced peace in your life. And so my prayer for you would be like the prayer of Hezekiah, who was a great 
uh, figure in the Old Testament of the Bible where he says, I want peace in my lifetime. So my desire for you as your pastor is that you would stop living with lemons and actually make lemonade. You would stop letting fear, worry, regret, shame rob you of peace And even as you go through the difficulties, you would realize there is a peace with God through the person of Jesus, then that's the foundation. You can have peace with others because it's part of our calling to pursue, to be peacemakers that plant seeds of peace. It might take a while for you to keep planting seeds in certain relationships, and eventually, the promise of God will reign true, that you'll have a harvest of righteousness. Because eventually someone will ask you, hey, how do you keep dealing with that situation? How do you keep peace in your life even though it's really difficult? And you will point them to a person because without the Spirit of God working in your life, you will not be able to have this kind of peace with other people. It's impossible. On my own strength, I am not good enough. I don't have enough willpower. I don't have enough strength. I am surely not equipped to deal with the complexities of relationships with people. But with God working and realizing it's part of my calling, it's part of his purpose, and he's given me the power of the Holy Spirit to pursue peace with others because I have Jesus and so now I have peace with God. I'm telling you, life gets really fun and just like the title of today's talk, it will be productive in your life, both naturally and spiritually. Some of you feel stagnated today in your faith because you have no peace. But if you would just grab a hold of this message today, this talk, this principles from the Bible, and apply them to your life, not just in your head, but allow the Spirit of God to work inside of you. Peace not only will come to the storm, but peace the wholeness, the completeness, the prosperity, the ongoing tranquility you will experience and you will do more damage in a good way for the kingdom of God than you ever have. Lastly, I believe, how do we get it and keep this kind of peace? Number three, we have to develop an active prayer life. To develop an active prayer life. Notice I said develop, that means it's an ongoing, it's continually, it's regular, it becomes a habit. We have to develop a prayer life And prayer, as we define it in our community, is the vehicle in which we get into to communicate with God. And so I know some of you didn't get raised in church. You're like, man, I don't even know where to begin with prayer. I'm not even sure what prayer looks like. Listen, prayer is simply you talking to God. It doesn't have to be some uh, theological statement or some mantra. It's simply you going, God, I need your peace. God, I need you to show up. God, if you don't show up, I'm not only not gonna have peace with you or peace with you, I surely won't have peace settled in my heart. Philippians 4 says it this way, don't worry about anything because it will rob you of peace. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace then you will is an imperative. That means it's going to happen. Then you will experience God's peace, not just in your head, but in your heart, in your life. You'll be complete. You'll be made whole. You will have tranquility ongoing and prosperity for your life, which exceeds anything we can understand. See, because some of you today, even now, you're like, man, I wish I could have this kind of peace. And it's so, it seems so good It can't be true. Like, how can you have peace going through the most painful circumstances of your life? Here here it is. It will exceed anything you can't understand. You can't understand it, but you can't experience it. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. See, the imagery of guarding your hearts and your mind is that of a fortress. It's really a, the, the thought of an imagery of a military outpost. And so when you stop worrying, because instead you're praying about everything, you're telling God what's really going on in your life, he'll exchange your worry for his peace, and it will blow your mind, it's that good, and it will also create a fortress, a military outpost, guarding your heart and guarding your mind. 
So you want to keep this peace? You want to experience it? It's saying yes to Jesus. It's getting your relationships right by keeping short accounts. And it's developing an active prayer life where every day, we call it the first 15, you get up and you pray for five, you read your Bible for five, and you worship for five. And when you make that a habit of communicating with God, by telling him what you need, by inviting him into your daily activity, I'm telling you, it exchanges the worries of life for his peace. Peace on the inside. Tranquility that never ceases. Ongoing completeness and wholeness for your life. You take the lemons that are thrown at you and you make some lemonade. You take the sour things of life and it, God turns them into sweet things. I've been through some hard things and in the middle of it, I like to say I'd always got it right. But today I'm preaching out of my own experience that I haven't always gotten it right. But God in his mercy has helped me walk things out. And eventually I remember Romans 8, 28. that says not all things are good in this life, but God will turn it for our good. He'll take the lemons and turn them into lemonade. He'll give me peace that surpasses all understanding and it will watch over my heart, watch over my mind, watch over the things that are concerning to me and I can cast that worry aside and let him truly be Lord of all. Would you join me in a prayer? God, I thank you for every single person watching. In this moment, I pray your peace would invade their life from the inside out. God, whatever they're facing, whatever they're going through, as difficult as it might be today, they would make a cognizant decision to take the lemons of life and let you by your spirit make lemonade out of them. That today for those that aren't Christians, they would start with the foundation which is saying yes to following Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time. And so God, I pray your grace would literally flow through every single person watching today and they would experience the shame of life being broken off, the newness of life entering in and them experiencing forgiveness, which ultimately is peace. Peace with God, peace with others, and peace with their past because they have a new story that you're writing from this day forward. In Jesus' name, and everyone watching, you said amen. Church, I'm telling you, share this message today. Wherever you're watching, you can go to our YouTube channel if you're watching there and share the link or Facebook or website. It's gonna hopefully it helped you, but I know it's gonna help other people. Show up next weekend for part two of Making Lemonade. As we wrap up today, I wanna encourage you to take a spiritual step. If you prayed a prayer for decision to follow Jesus, go right now to rockcreek.online slash next. Okay, and if you wanna give today, you're welcome to do that via the link that you're looking at. There'll be a link coming up. Thank you so much for your uh, generosity as you partner with us financially. Again, your giving is making a significant impact, not only in the region where we have a physical location, but literally as we broadcast all over the world, people are hearing the good news of Jesus. Listen to me, church. You're doing better than you think, and God bless. Thank you again for joining us for Church at Home today. We wanna help you grow in your faith as you take your right next step. If you said yes to following Jesus, if you need prayer for anything, or if you just wanna get more connected in a meaningful way, please visit us at rockcreek.online slash next. We want you to know that we are praying for you, we believe in you, and we are always here for you. We hope to see you online next week.